And good morning to all of you who are joining us on Zoom as well this morning. We're so glad to be here for this blended service. Bear with us today. This is still a work in progress and we are still fine tuning it. So thank you for your patience and thank you for your presence. And on that note, it is now the time for all ages. And I was thinking about what I wanted to share today. And since we're really focusing on the mural, I wanted to focus on people who see something that's kind of bare or kind of blank, and they have a vision of beauty and joy, and then they make that vision reality, no matter how silly it might seem to other people or no matter how impossible. And so this is a story about a little girl named Wanda. It's called Wanda's Roses, and it's by Pat Brisson. One morning, on the way to school, Wanda noticed a bush growing in an empty corner of a lot at Fillmore and Hudson Streets. It must have been growing for a while because it was about two feet tall, and Wanda was surprised she hadn't noticed it before, but there it was. It was kind of bare and kind of thorny, kind of brown. And Wanda, who loved beautiful things, she felt her heart beat a little faster. A rose bush, she said to herself. It's my very own rose bush. Now, this rose bush didn't really belong to Wanda, but since nobody seemed to own that vacant lot or the, the heaps of junk and trash that were piled there, she decided that she would care for this bush and make it her own. All during school that day, she thought about her rose bush. During art, she, she drew pictures of what it would be like in bloom, beautiful pink flowers. During library, she, she borrowed some books on arranging flowers, looking forward to the time she would be able to do that with her roses. During science class, she asked so many questions about how to take care of roses that finally her teacher said she must stop asking questions about roses and start thinking about electricity, which is what the lesson was about today. Well, after school, she rushed back to her rose bush. It was still kind of bare and thorny. Maybe... Maybe it needs some more sun, she thought. So she, she put down her school bag and she started to drag some of the nearby trash out to the curb. Now, Mrs. Turner, who was on her way to the corner store, stopped to help her with a broken chair that was a little too heavy for Wanda. Why are you cleaning up the neighborhood, Wanda? Mrs. Turner asked. What a nice project for you to do. Oh, I'm, I'm not just cleaning, Wanda said. I'm helping my rose bush to get some more sun so it'll bloom. Your rose bush, Mrs. Turner said. Where is your rose bush? Right there, Wanda said, pointing proudly to that bare thorny bush. Oh, Wanda, I'm not sure that's a rose bush, said Mrs. Turner. Well, sure it is, said Wanda. I've seen rose bushes in books, and this is what they look like before they bloom. You just wait. In a few weeks, it'll be full of roses. Well, said Mrs. Turner, good luck with that, Wanda. And as she walked away, Mrs. Turner thought to herself, if that's a rose bush, then I'm the Queen of England. The next day, after school, Wanda hurried back to her rose bush, but it was still kind of bare and brown and thorny. Maybe it needs more air, more fresh air, thought Wanda. So she put her school back down and she started taking more of the trash out to the curb. Once I get all this trash out of here, nothing will block the fresh air from getting to my rose bush. Mr. Claudel was on his way home from work, and he saw Wanda trying to drag an old door out of the alley, and he stopped to help. Hmm. 
cleaning up the neighborhood, are you, Wanda? He asked. Not just cleaning, Mr. Claudel, Wanda told him. I'm getting rid of this trash, so my rose bush is going to get some more fresh air. A rose bush here, said Mr. Claudel. And so Wanda showed him the rose bush. I don't know much about gardening, Wanda, Mr. Claudel said, frowning, but I, I don't think that's a rose bush. Sure it is, said Wanda. And in a few weeks, this lot will be filled with the sweetest smelling roses you ever smelled. She thanked Mr. Claudel for his help and went to drag away some more trash. Mr. Claudel shook his head. Huh, if that's a rose bush, he said, then I'm the king of France. Even every day after school that week and the next, Wanda worked in that empty lot. Mr. Mrs. Giamoni, who lived in the apartment next door, gave Wanda some trash bags for the old shoes and beer bottles and broken toys and bits of glass that she dug up. You've done a great job cleaning this lot, Wanda, Mrs. Giamoni told her. Oh, I'm not just cleaning, Wanda said. I have to get rid of all of this trash so my rose bush will get enough sun and fresh air to bloom. But where is your rose bush? Mrs. Giamoni asked. So Wanda showed her. <sighs> Mrs. Giamoni put her hand on Wanda's shoulder and spoke softly to her. Wanda, she said, this is not a rose bush. Oh, but it is, said Wanda. And in a few weeks, this lot will be filled with the most beautiful roses you've ever seen. That would be nice, Mrs. Giamoni said, but I don't want you to be too disappointed if it doesn't bloom. Don't worry, Mrs. G uh, don't worry, Wanda answered. I won't be disappointed. Mrs. Giamoni sighed. That is not a rose bush and will never be one, she thought to herself. The next week, when the rose bush still wasn't blooming, Wanda talked to her school librarian. I need some books about getting roses to bloom, she said. Oh, do you have a rose bush, Wanda? Ms. Jones asked. Yes, yes, but it doesn't have flowers yet, and I know it has enough sun and fresh air. Does it have enough water? Miss Jones asked. Water, Wanda said. Of course, that's what it needs. So that afternoon, she hurried back to the rose bush. It was still bare and thorny. She looked at the dry ground and she smiled. Don't worry, little bush, she said. I'll get you some water and then you'll be able to grow flowers. Wanda went to the butcher shop across the street. Mr. Sanchez, would you please give me some water for my rose bush? Rose bush? Is that what I see you taking care of and talking to every day over there? Are you sure that's a rose bush, Wanda? Mr. Sanchez asked. Oh, yes, I'm sure, but it can't bloom because it needs water. Mr. Sanchez gave her some water in a plastic bucket. I hope that really is a rose bush, Wanda, he said, looking at her doubtfully. You'll see, Wanda told him. In a few weeks, that whole lot will be full of roses. As Wanda carried the water to her rose bush, Mr. Sanchez muttered, <laughs> In a few weeks, that thorn bush will still be a thorn bush. Every day, Wanda ran to her rose bush after school, but every day it was still bare and thorny. She watered it, and she sang to it and she checked its branches for roses. Mr. Claudel, on his way home from work, stopped to see if there were any roses yet. Mrs. Turner, on her way to the butcher shop, stopped to see if there were any roses yet. Mrs. Giamoni, seeing Wanda in the lot, called down from her apartment to ask Wanda if there were any roses yet. <sighs> but the answer was always no. And every day when Wanda went to the butcher shop for water, Mr. Sanchez asked her, were there any roses yet? To each person, Wanda would answer the same thing. 
No, but just you wait. Pretty soon this whole lot's gonna be filled with roses. Then one day in June, Wanda had an idea. Looking at that bare thorny bush, she said, if my roses, rose bush won't give roses to me, then I'll have to bring roses to my rose bush. And when she saw Mrs. Turner and Mr. Claudel and Mrs. Giamoni and Ms. Jones and Mr. Sanchez, she gave each of them an invitation that said, please come for tea and muffins in Wanda's Rose Garden Saturday morning at nine. Oh dear, said Mrs. Turner, is she still expecting to get roses from that bush? Oh no, said Mr. Claudel, and she's worked so hard too. Oh my, said Miss Giamoni, she'll be so disappointed. Oh, darn, said Mr. Sanchez, she'll, she'll be disappointed unless I do something. Oh, good, said Miss Jones, who'd only heard about the bush from Wanda and hadn't seen it herself. I'll bring the blueberry muffins. The night before the tea, everyone was very, very busy. And the next morning at nine, everyone was surprised to see Wanda's rose bush covered with roses, paper roses, that Wanda had made herself and carefully tied onto each bare thorny branch. But more surprising yet, everyone who came to the party had brought along a real rose bush to plant near Wanda's. And after they'd eaten their blueberry muffins and drunk their tea, they all got busy planting those rose bushes. Mr. Claudel and Mrs. Turner dug the holes. Mrs. Giamoni held the bushes in place while Wanda and Ms. Jones filled around the roots with soil. And Mr. Sanchez brought water from his shop and watered them all quite thoroughly. And when the work was finished, Mr. Claudel said, Wanda, this is going to be a rose garden fit for a king. Or a queen, said Mrs. Turner. Wanda and the others smiled. And later that summer, the whole lot was filled with the biggest, most beautiful and sweet smelling roses that anyone had ever seen just as Wanda always said it would be. By way of some background as to how we got here, back in mid-2018, then Board of Trustees President Doug Russell asked a few people to get together and see what we could do to spruce up the church building. It had been a long time since it had had any real attention, and we were not looking our best. A committee, including Jan Crack, Annette Krisevich, Lee Costis, Lisa Balson, Lynn Brown, Roseanne Barker, Doug, and myself, walked through every space and came up with a plan. We wanted to have a welcoming, functional, clean church home that showed the pride that all of us feel. Plans were finalized, donations were received, and work began. There were endless sorting, organizing, painting, and new carpet, a welcoming message, an information wall, new lighting, and then finally, the crown jewel of the project, the Olympia Brown Room with its 33-foot-long wall. Lots of ideas were floated as to what we could do to tell our story without being cluttered with tacked-up messages. Lisa Balson told us about her participation in a looking glass art project, a community art project by a group of people, unrelated except for having signed up to a local class. They gave input to two artists through stories, conversations, and many workshops. Out of it came a blueprint of sorts that they worked together to fabricate. People came together, some that didn't know each other at all, to work on it. Small parts joining with other small parts to form a collaborative piece of art that no one person could have conceived alone. This new piece hung in the building which housed that art class. 
it sounded like just what we were looking for. We contacted those two artists, Tom Ferraro and Ed Glass. Um, you'll get to meet Tom in a, in a bit. They came to see our big wall and hear our story. We wanted something that showed what we're about, who we are, where we came from, and give voice to our hope for the future. You've heard that working with UUs can be like herding cats. We invited all members and friends of our congregation, and Tom and Ed asked lots of questions, listened, made us draw, color, make up stories. It was a challenge for some of us. They managed to design something that integrated our principles and focus our history and priorities and brought it all together. And then we got to work on it with them to create it. The majority of our members and friends had a hand in this project. It was, even with COVID getting in the way, a nice way to make connections and fill that big wall with our story. If you didn't get a chance to read the narrative on the podiums in the Olympia Brown Room on your way in today, please take a minute to do that. It will be easy to spot the elements um, that you read about as you are able to, to view the, the mural. Um, the two artists, Tom Ferraro and Ed Glass, um, were the, the creations, the creators of the Looking Glass Art Project. Uh, we do have a video from Tom Ferraro, uh, and following that, we had hoped to see Ed Glass um, by Zoom, but we don't have Ed, do we? Okay. Um, Ed contacted me this morning. He has, has a family emergency. I was kind of hoping we would even get a, a voicemail from him. I brought my phone up just in case, um, but we will hear from Tom now. Uh, we actually have a, a video of the entire mural that we were hoping to show. And then there is a, a video that Tom sent um, us. And so uh, Clyde, who is the screen share usher today, if you could roll those videos at this time. Okay, while we're waiting for that to happen, um, I will share with you just a, a little bit about uh, some of the elements in the mural, and we can talk about it a little bit more after you get to see the video. Um, but What a wonderful gift that Tom and Ed and Nancy and all the folks who worked on the mural have given us. Appreciate it. Um, I did want to just touch a little bit uh, on the various octagons so that we have an opportunity to see them and talk about them a little bit. So um, if we can bring up the slides with the photos of the mural, um, one at a time, I can talk through them a little bit. Um, so on the far left side of the wall, there is an octagon that represents the, um, the energy of the sun and its role in sustaining and really creating life on Earth. It's uh, also representative of Erie's beautiful sunrise and sunset. And then intersecting with that is the second octagon that represents this congregation's commitment to the arts demonstrated by the the project of this mural and also by our uh, 
our love of music, especially the importance of music, not only in the weekly services, but as a space, this space is a place where there are many concerts and gatherings, um, not just on Sundays. Making music together is a value that we hold dearly. Now, in the next slide, if you'll go on to the next slide, um, there is next to the next to the musical octagon, there is a um, picture of two clasped hands um, that are multicolored, and that symbolizes the aspirational values of multiracial and multi multicultural inclusion and also the guidance of a multi-generational community that values education, mentorship, uh, raising the next generation. And then we can move on to the next photo, which is of the beautiful center flame. And of course, the flame here is, is as Tom said, the, the symbol of our faith. And the, the symbol has many meanings, of course. It's perhaps different for each person, but here uh, the flame most likely represents the universalist themes, as Tom remarked on, of hope and the sacred and the Unitarian theme of the quest for truth. Uh, this flame is embraced by a chalice of vines, uh, and you can see that it's rising from the embers of the earth. And then moving on to the next image, uh, the fifth octagon is an image of a ladle and a bowl passing food to an outstretched hand, and that symbolizes community service, which is also very strong in this congregation. In particular, stories of the ongoing service project this congregation has of providing lunches to the upper room in downtown Erie. And then uh, adjacent to that is the sixth octagon, which is filled with an image of the earth surrounded by symbols of various religions of the world. And I think this coordinates really nicely with our sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Um, and there's also um, an image of the earth because of our concern, as Tom also spoke of, uh, for the environment and for the uh, condition of the earth for our concern about climate change. Um, when the workshops were done, the future of the planet was overwhelmingly the number one social issue that the participants uh, expressed fear and worry and, and um, passion about. Uh, and the interaction of the various symbols um, reflects on Unitarian Universalist respect and inclusion for all religions and all beliefs among our congregation. And then, I'm sure you will recognize if we move on to the final, uh, the final image, um, represents, of course, uh, beaches along the Lake Erie shoreline. It serves as a reminder in, that here in Erie, we are in a geographic area that's rich in beauty, joyful experiences by the water, beaches and forests, an abundance of wildlife, and also nicely coordinates with our seventh principle, respect for the independent web of life uh, of which we are a part. So, uh, and I mentioned that the overall composition, as you can see, has radiating bands of rainbow colors, and that is symbolizing that we are a welcoming community, affirming all genders and all sexual orientations here, that all are welcome here. A large pink shaped ribbon surrounds the top of the band, and that forms a heart that envelops the entire composition, and that is the symbol of love that embraces the core of our principles and certainly um, our universalist beginnings and our mission here at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Erie. Our closing words today are some favorites of mine from an artist 
writer named Tony Cade Bambara, who said, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. So may we always bring the beauty and the joy to make transformation irresistible and delightful. And now if you have lit a chalice flame or a candle, those of you at home, uh, I invite you to extinguish the flame as we close our service with these familiar words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs>